Hello everyone, a very warm welcome to Canberra's second webinar of 2024, continuing our monthly webinar series where we focus on macro and market developments. Um, we are expecting quite a few people uh, from several countries today, so while we wait uh, a little long for those attendees to join, I'll run through some housekeeping. Um, so firstly, you'll notice that your lines are muted and your cameras are turned off. Ours will also be turned off during a presentation to minimise technical disruptions, but mainly to allow you as the audience to focus on the presentation slides, because there's a lot to get through today. Um, and also on your screen, you'll notice you have a, a control panel and you should see a resources tab on there. If you click on that, there are three tabs at the top, one being links, and that's where we'll be posting the link to the report that we're presenting today. And there's also a link on there to our website where you can uh, sign up to receive other research from our team, like our FX weekly report and our daily market reports. Now, for today's presentation, um, as you can see, our speakers include myself. I'm George, the lead FX strategist based here in the UK. And we've got Boris, our global macro strategist based in Vienna, and also Ruta, our G10 FX strategist based here in the UK as well. And in terms of the agenda, I'll shortly be handing over to Boris for an overview of the global economic outlook, highlighting the most important key themes dominating the macro space and influencing financial markets. Uh, Boris will then hand over to Ruta to kickstart the currency market overview and the forecast scenarios that we that we create in partnership with Oxford Economics. Uh, a specific focus from Ruta on North America and the US dollar before she finishes off by handing over to me and I look at the UK and the pound. Now, before we get stuck into the detail, uh, we do, as usual, like to provide a high level overview of some of the key stats from our research here at Canberra. So um, to start with, the US dollar has uh, or continues to have its best start to a year since uh, 2015, thanks to the outperformance of the US economy, uh, but also because of the pushback by uh, Fed policymakers against rate, interest rate cutting expectations in the first quarter of this year. So the dollar had another strong month in February. It hit a three-month high against a basket of currencies in line with the three-month highs that we saw with US yields. Um, but the dollar's dominance seems to be fading slightly. Uh, its strength moderating compared to the, the January, uh, robust January that it had. Um, over in Europe, we still have some concerns around uh, economic growth, especially um, Germany weighing down on the on the broader Eurozone uh, economic outlook. And that's one main reason really behind the Euro's challenging start to this year. Um, it did hit a three month low against the US dollar, but ended the month pretty much flat. And that was helped by investors pairing back expectations of uh, ECB rate cuts from this year from uh, uh, about six to less than four for 2024. And then for the British pound, um, we had that strong January performance, as we know, supported by the uptick in UK inflation and uh, strong activity data. And that led to hawkish repricing in, uh, of Bank of England interest rate expectations. Now, February was slightly weaker. Uh, there was a lack of fresh catalyst fueling volatility, but the pound is still the best, uh, the second best performing currency uh, of the majors after the US dollar year to date. And then down under, the Aussie dollar remains under pressure due to the continued negative news flow that we're having out of China, but it did find some much needed uh, support. And that was mainly thanks to the renewed risk, uh, risk appetite globally that we've seen uh, in the hope that central banks will start cutting rates across the board later in this year. Will more of a delay to these expected rate cuts uh, start to unnerve, uh, unnerve investors though, uh, and cause some volatility to, uh, to pick up across financial markets, especially in the sleepy FX markets that we currently have at the moment. Um, both realized and implied volatility is at multi-year lows in the FX space right now. But the volatility in the macro space, the economic data has been anything but sleepy. We've, we've seen uh, surprises to the upside and downside, leading to some uh, quite dramatic shifts in interest rate expectations. So let's delve into that a little more with an overview from um, of, of the global macro climate that we're currently in and possibly going into. So I'll hand over to Boris now for the Global Economic Outlook. Cheers, Boris. Well, thank you, George, for the brilliant introduction, but for also, again, setting the scene for us, because as you said, my contribution to most of the webinars we are holding will be to just unpack some of the recent developments on the macro side that we have seen, 
We'll also look at what narratives have been driving financial markets and also give an overview or what we call a forward guidance about the potential market movers for the month of March ahead. And I will start my part by kind of giving a brief overview of what, at least in our opinion, are these three major themes that have been driving markets so far this year. Inflation, first and foremost, monetary policy, and something of an overarching theme, namely this existence of all the various uncertainties and what we call the points of tensions that are yet to influence the low volatility rates across asset classes. So beginning with inflation on our first slide, we can really say that it continues to be a major macro category driving financial markets. Because while prices were going up um, from, if we remember, around 2021 to the middle of 2023, inflation dictated how fast and to what extent central banks would increase interest rates. And now on the way down that inflation is falling, it continues to guide monetary policy because the faster inflation falls and settles at the inflation target of around 2%, the sooner central banks will start cutting interest rates and the better risk assets will perform, all else being equal. So the good news for us on the price front, or at least for investors, is that annual inflation rates are continuing to go down. We can see this by looking at this very comprehensive outline of US inflation uh, that we have divided into multiple categories. But it would be the same picture for the Eurozone or for the UK economy. Because looking at inflation momentum, meaning if we take the last six months of inflation and annualize it, that measure has fallen to its lowest level since the beginning of 2021 for the UK at 0.4% and for the Eurozone at 0.6%. And we can also see it again in this chart that while US inflation is still well above the 2% target, that the Federal Reserve is targeting, it definitely has slowed over the past two months. This is kind of the good news on the macro side. The bad news is that what really spooked markets at the beginning of the year was that if we look at monthly inflation prints, meaning we take inflation, we leave out the base effects, meaning the comparison to the previous month, and just look at the month of January alone, this came in much stronger than expected at 0.4% in the US. And the same goes true for the UK and the Eurozone. And adding to that fact, um, the fact that inflation expectations are also on the rise on the US because the uh, uh, US economy has been outperforming expectations and some leading indicators suggesting that inflation could settle above 2%, this kind of all was enough to bring inflation fears back to the forefront of investors. And that is the reason, I think, for our second development of the, of the year so far, which is on, this, uh, on the next slide, um, meaning that the second one, based on inflation kind of rebounding in January, is the theme of investors pairing back their expectations that the central banks in the UK, um, in the US, but also the Eurozone, would cut interest rates aggressively this year. And the reason for that is that because the fall of inflation has slowed, and because the global economy continues to somewhat hold up, investors had to cut back their bets on policy easing from these three central banks, from the Fed, from the BOE, and from the ECB. And if you look at this chart, it tells us that going into the year, investors expected these three central banks to cut interest rates over the next 24 months by around 700 basis points. And this has been paired back to now just having uh, or expecting 460 basis points of cuts, which is quite significant, and a reduction of one third of these policy easing bets. So again, while the policy easing cycle has already turned, um, because most central banks in emerging markets have actually started cutting interest rates, the major central banks that markets are really focused on that are market moving, they are likely to cut rates less than expected in much later than expected going into this year. And this had, of course, major implications on currency markets, as George kind of mentioned, and as we'll see in our effects section later. But what it didn't really do is create lots of volatility. Because while we mentioned in our previous webinars, we also continue to mention it in our daily market updates to clients, major risks loom large over markets. But these issues haven't really been able to manifest themselves in larger trading ranges. And that is, in and of itself, I think on the next slide is something we, we show here, 
that lack of volatility is in and of itself as a, a theme uh, for itself for Q1 of this year. Um, this inability of these big issues, geopolitics, uh, the war in the Middle East, stagnating inflation rates, the pairing back of easing bets, the, the inability of these issues to move volatility rates higher is something we've really noted over the last couple of weeks. And with European and US elections coming up, we do think that markets are kind of underpricing their underlying risks so far, especially when you consider that equity markets are record highs. It kind of adds to the fact that markets are priced for a Goldilocks scenario where the Fed cuts rates, inflation falls, but the US economy continues to kind of perform well, which for us is rather unlikely to have all of these three scenarios going into one. So again, yes, volatility is low, as we mentioned, but it doesn't mean that these discussed issues, these macro topics, haven't had a major impact on the direction of financial markets, if not on volatility, because they certainly had. And one way of showing this impact on markets is the chart on the next page, because this chart we have used many times and I like it a lot because it shows how interconnected markets really are. And because we like to think about markets in these kind of broad terms and look at markets from a global perspective, we've seen that financial markets have been in these two very distinct regimes from November. So the first one is, as you see, from November to the beginning of January of this year, in which US macro data had really been disappointing across the board, which is why the green line here had been trending down. And because of this, bets of the Fed starting its cutting cycle in March um, had been going up because this line is in inverse here. Uh, and this led to the US dollar being really strong, uh, sorry, really weak uh, in November and December, the euro rising, the pound rising, but also bond yields falling as well. However, as we said, January has seen somewhat of a regime shift because we have already mentioned inflation has been rebounding and the macro data here in green has also been rebounding in the US. And this led to a stronger US dollar coming into the year rebounding um, bond yields, but also evaporating expectations that the Fed would cut in March, right? With the probability of this happening in two weeks time, basically at 0% right now. One development that doesn't fit this quite nice narrative um, is the continued rise in global stock markets. Um, because the US equity benchmark, the S&P 500, ended last week at another new all-time high. Um, which is a feat that the S&P 500 has already achieved seven times this year. So the stock market of the US has risen for um, all but two weeks since November, and it has gained 25% over the course of the last four months. And as I said, uh, this achievement is even more impressive against this year's trend reversal or the January regime, where we had rising government bond yields and somewhat of a resilient US dollar. So I think this is kind of a starting point for us going into March before we look at the calendar on the next page. No rate cuts expected in Q1 from the BOE, from the ECB and from the Fed, based on strong economic data and these rebounding inflation rates. Then we have a resilient US dollar, even though the strength has uh, abated a bit, it's still kind of a resilient US dollar story. We have rising yields, but also a defiant stock market. So now the question going into March, into our risk calendar is basically, will some of these themes change? Um, and will they spill over into Q2? That's kind of the big question right now. Um, what we can say for sure is there's not a lack of data coming our way to answer these questions because March is typically seen as kind of a macro and a monetary policy heavy month uh, with all major central banks setting policy. This week, for example, starts with the Eurozone on Thursday in Japan on the 19th with the Bank of Japan, the US Fed, a day after, and then concluding the month of policy meetings is the UK's Bank of England on the 21st of March. And we will get also very important macro releases, um, not only all the inflation prints, that will be important because as I said, um, inflation has been uptick, uh, has seen an uptick in January. And now the question is, is this a prolonged theme or is it just a one-off effect that has been caused in January? And labor market reports are coming up for all the free major regions as well. As I said, one major expectations we have for so far for March is that the inflationary uptick in January in the US has, or at least uh, also some parts in, in Europe as well, has kind of been a one-off effect, meaning that it was mainly driven by yearly adjustments, by revisions, 
that is one off effects. So the February CPI prints for the UK, the Eurozone and the US should see a continuation of this disinflationary trend of the previous months, which should in theory be risk positive, all else being equal. So this is one forecast we have for March. The second one is that we are also looking to confirm the end of US exceptionalism. Because as we mentioned, the US has really outperformed all expectations, outperformed all its peers in the post-pandemic period. And now we're starting to see some cracks emerging with the latest data on, for example, the purchasing manager indices, both falling for the services and for the manufacturing sector, uh, to say just a couple of examples. While at the same time, Europe and China are starting to recover, although from really low levels, but momentum is still bottoming. So the incoming data in March and also in April will be a key for us to gauge where we are in this particular trend of the potential convergence of these strong uh, US economy and the weak European and Chinese economy. Just going back briefly on the next page to kind of the highlight of the month that I've mentioned, the rate decisions of the G3 central banks. So overall markets and we ourselves as well are not really expecting the Fed, the BOE and the ECB to make changes or significant changes to their policy this month. However, we are kind of awaiting new projections on rates, on inflation, on growth from the central banks. And these tend to be used as a signaling tool and for setting expectations or setting forward guidance um, from central banks. So this is why they'll be important. There has also been kind of a prominent debate in recent time about the possibility of the Fed not cutting interest rates at all this year, just based on, as we discussed, the stronger than expected economy. But we would kind of have to disagree with this view because our own inflation forecasts and pretty much all the leading indicators that we have do suggest that the June meeting is highly likely to be the starting point of the cutting cycle for both the Fed and for the ECB. Of course, there are risks to any outlook, to any base case scenario. And another postponement of the easing cycle uh, into Q3 is definitely also a possibility. And that would definitely be negative for risk assets and for currencies like the euro and the pound. But we just don't see it as a base case scenario for now. So just to, again, briefly summarize our views to have a good starting point for the FX slides. So in general, inflation volatility continues to be high and has in recent months really led markets to reduce their bets on policy easing this year, um, which is why the US dollar and bond deals got a really good start into the year. However, uh, annual inflation rates, as we have shown with the US example, continue to decline. And this is one reason for why stock markets have continued to outperform expectations. Market volatility remains low across assets, but March offers, I would say, some interesting macro and policy events that should induce at least some price action into markets. So I think that's it from my side. Um, so with that in mind, I can hand over to my colleagues, Ruda and George, for some insights into currency markets. Thank you, Boris, for setting the scene with a great update on the recent macro trends driving the markets. So to kick off the update on North America um, currency trends, um, let's first start by analyzing the recent volatility trends observed in US dollar and Canadian dollar denominated currency pairs. So the heat map, uh, heat map here in front of you is based on a 30 day and year to day timeframes showing highs and lows for a list of 10 currency pairs their respective trading ranges during these timeframes, and also the latest positions within these ranges as of right now. So over the past month, the FX market has seen a remarkable trend of subdued volatility. And this is largely attributed to the lack of major adjustments in policy rates by central banks. However, despite the stability, there have been some interesting developments uh, worth noting. US dollar Swiss, for example, experienced the highest volatility over the past 30 days, deviating by 4% from its bid lows and highs. Although the Swiss consumer price index surprise on the upside, it still falls short of the bank's own forecast, raising speculations about potential policy easing by the Swiss National Bank as early as in the upcoming meeting on March 21st, which would be the earliest out of all G10 central banks. Meanwhile, other major currency pairs like sterling dollar, euro dollar and dollar CAD have remained within tight trading ranges, reflecting lowest realized volatility over the past four years. 
So FX volatility is typically driven by the outlook and implication of policy and interest rate divergence, and often led by US Federal Reserve. However, despite the extent of Fed uh, rate cuts being reduced and the timing of those cuts being extended, the rate view in other major economies has been adjusted in a similar fashion. So until we there is some divergence in interest rate expectations, FX volatility is expected to stay low, with economic data releases serving as the key indicators for policy insights. Amidst this landscape, um, US dollar CNY has displayed the lowest volatility, trading in a remarkably tight range of only 328 basis points over the course of February. And this is largely due to the peg nature of the Chinese currency. However, earlier reports from the China's National uh, People's Congress lacked any surprises, uh, maintaining economic growth targets and budget deficits for 2024. Markets were expecting more concrete stimulus measures to tackle challenges such as a property crisis and sluggish consumption. Moving on to the next slide, um, I would now like to spend the next few minutes evaluating the relative positioning of the currency pairs to help gauge their fair value versus their respective, uh, respective short and long term moving averages. So in the other evolving landscape of forex markets, the recent months have been marked by shifts and recalibrations, particularly concerning the strength of the US dollar. While US, um, sorry, while January witnessed a widespread surge in the greenback's value against a majority of its counterparts, February saw a moderation in the strength. Despite this, on a year-to-date basis, the dollar does remain resilient and continues to outperform 43% of um, currencies, despite a recent decline in the US yields. This stability is further underscored by the alignment of market expectations with the Federal Reserve's projections and comments. Also, the stark contrast in economic performance between a robust US economy and recession in Europe and Japan suggests that the dollar may not weaken substantially in the short term, especially as positive economic surprises continue to support its strength. But as Boris mentioned, we are looking for signs for such a regime shift going forward. Aside from mechanical correlation of Japanese yen and Swiss with the Federal Reserve expectations, the press FX volatility has kept carry trades popular. And as a result, Japanese yen continues to underperform and is close to 25% below its five year average against the US dollar. Market expectations for the Bank of Japan to adjust rates in April could potentially lead to a depreciation of dollar yen pair from the current levels. In contrast, the Mexican peso, which is a common destination for carry trades, has had a relatively good month in February, climbing over 0.7% against the US dollar and is currently trading in the upper half of its 30-day trading range. However, the Canadian dollar does remain under pressure and is trading below both medium and long-term averages as the outlook for US trades continues to dictate the direction of USD CAD pair. And while the recent stream of, ca uh, of data indicates that Canada's economy is more resilient than expected, there is now a risk that the central bank could turn more dovish during the central bank meeting later today, given the lower than expected inflationary figures. Such a turn could be negative, uh, could have a negative effect on the Canadian dollar, and we could see USD CAD breach past 136 mark. Finally, turning to the euro dollar pair, the euro has managed to recover from its shocking performance in January, driven by February's inflation data suggesting persistent inflationary pressures. This has um, led markets to revise down expectations for ECB rate cuts, strengthening the case for a policy rate easing cycle later towards the end of Q2. And with that, let's move on to the FX forecast scenarios next and dive deeper into what can we expect over the next eight quarters for the euro dollar and dollar CAD pairs. So here at Convera, we follow a scenario based approach when it comes to forecasting nominal exchange rate trends and believe evaluating various scenarios that may occur in the future, as well as understanding the possible exchange rate implications of said scenarios should help businesses identify high risk situations in order to minimize potential losses, but also to identify opportunities to act upon. 
So focusing on the chart in front of you, the left hand side shows the historical exchange rate of euro dollar ba uh, based on its weekly um, closing prices. And on the right hand side, we have a forecast fan chart, which shows a range of paths that the exchange rate could take over the course of the next eight quarters, which is based on the exchange rate fundamentals and their respective future trajectories. And as a reminder, these forecasts have been created in a partnership with the Oxford Economics, which is using a behavioral long term fair value equilibrium model and incorporates a range of variables such as interest rates, growth and inflation differentials. From the baseline, we then calculate a one standard deviation above and below to provide a central scenario, which is the gray shaded area in the middle and should account for over 68 percent of the future outcomes. So looking specifically at the euro dollar pair and its forecast for the near future, our March 4 projections remain steady, given the fact that spot prices continue to hold around our current forecast levels. This means that our near term expectation for euro USD stands at 109 level by the end of Q1 of 2024. And in our central scenario, we do anticipate stability in the range of 106 to 110 until Q3, with the increased volatility expected towards um, the year end. However, as I mentioned, it is crucial to consider both upside and downside scenarios to our baseline and to see euro um, dollar appreciate beyond 110 um, levels, we would need to see um, a, an improvement in the global economic um, growth outlook, which would then boost risk sentiment and support pro cyclical currencies like the euro. On the opposite end, if inflation in the Eurozone falls faster than expected, uh, prompting earlier policy rate cuts by the ECB, we could see euro dollar depreciate towards 106 levels and below. Moving on to the um, US dollar CAD pair next, compared to the February uh, forecast, similarly to euro USD, our March forecast remain largely unchanged anticipating the pair to depreciate to a 132 level by year end. We do hold the view that the Canadian dollar is presently undervalued relative to its fair value equilibrium, suggesting long term convergence towards high 120s bearing any systematic shocks. Considering potential um, scenarios, should Canada's inflation ease, fast, um, ease faster than expected, pressuring the Bank of Canada to curve rates more aggressively, we could see USD CAD appreciate beyond our central scenario and potentially breaching 136, 137 levels. Recent data does hint at this possibility with strong fourth quarter GDP growth, robust retail sales in January and a resilient jobs market. Coupled with lower than expected inflation, which could prompt a more aggressive response from the Bank of Canada. On the opposite end, if the Federal Reserve were to adopt a more dovish stance and cut rates earlier than implied by the current market pricing, we might witness the downside scenario for USD CAD materialize. This would necessitate either faster easing of US inflation or signs of weakening in the labor market, prompting Fed action. On that note, thank you for listening to the North America update. Now I'll pass you back to George for updates on the recent sterling trends. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, thanks a lot, Ruta. Some excellent insight there, as usual, uh, especially for the euro dollar currency pair. Uh, as we keep saying on these webinars, it is the most heavily traded currency pair in the world. And therefore, if we do see any major swings in that, yeah, it tends to have knock on effects uh, or influences other currency pairs, such as sterling against the US dollar. Uh, nearly a one for one correlation, those two hold. Now, um, I'm going to look now at the UK um, and the sterling well, the GBP outlook relative to other currencies, but particularly the US dollar. So what's driving the pound and what might unfold in the future? Uh, firstly, let's look at the recent volatility we've witnessed. Um, what was really surprising again in February was this continued small trading range that we saw in sterling against the US dollar. Uh, just a 2% range, a low of around uh, 125 and a high of around 127.70, um, which was sort of in line with the year-to-date range, in fact. So overall, 2024 has really lacked that volatility. And our analysis shows that the average monthly trading range over the past decade for sterling dollar has been 4%. Uh, and even the median, which excludes big outliers, uh, has been 3.7%. So this 
two percent range that we've seen over the last um, couple of months is uh, is very unusual compared to historical standards. Uh, elsewhere, the pound trade is an even tighter range against the euro, uh, within a tiny one percent barrier. There, uh, it came in close to uh, to reaching its highest level since August twenty twenty two. Um, nearer the 118, but it did retrace quite sharply back under 117, where it sort of lingers today. Um, and the euro was helped by the reduced bets um, of the of the uh, European Central Bank cutting interest rates as much as we mentioned at the start. So uh, that helped strengthen the euro and drag uh, sterling euro back towards 117. Uh, other notable call outs on the majors here include sterling against the Japanese yen. That rose to its highest level since uh, 2015, above the uh, 191 handle. Uh, and sterling against the Swiss franc, uh, that rose to its highest level since June last year. And the main reason for the weakness of the yen and the Swissy, as Ruta mentioned, is this policy divergence and the carry trades hurting the lower yielding currencies. Um, so again, to reiterate, Bank of Japan keeping interest rates at record lows, whilst the Swiss National Bank is expected to start cutting rates before its peers, as Ruta, uh, as Ruta mentioned earlier. So that makes the yen and the franc less appealing to investors, especially um, considering the current environment of low volatility, which we have at the moment. And uh, that sort of spurs investors on to take on more risk and hunt for higher yield elsewhere. Um, but overall, the pound does remain the second best performing currency uh, of the majors year to date, as I said at the start. And one of the reasons is thanks to its yield appeal, um, but it did only appreciate against 30% of its global peers in February, compared to 70% that appreciated against in January. So that strong start to the year certainly seems to be uh, moderating for the pound. And we think that it's because the pound was benefiting more from this uh, yield advantage at the start. Um, but that yield advantage is not increasing. If anything, uh, it's decreasing now that markets are starting to readjust the pricing of, of other central banks as well, i.e. Um, the, the fact that they're thinking now they're delayed to rate cuts and reduce policy easing overall for this year by other central banks like the, the Fed and ECB, for example. So it's coming more in line with, with uh, the Bank of England's uh, expectations as well. So that brings me on to uh, the next slide, which suggests that the pound perhaps shouldn't be as high as it currently is against the US dollar um, for this reason alone anyway. We did warn that the pound um, was vulnerable to any rates repricing in the short term, just due to the, the huge hawkish repricing that we saw at the start of the year, giving it a buffer. Um, so although we have seen that repricing uh, that should be uh, unfavorable for the pound, uh, more so over the last month, as I've highlighted on the, in the chart on the, on the left there, um, despite that, you know, stern and dollars held up pretty well. Um, so to keep this simple, the, the teal line on this chart shows the development of the 12 month rate differential between the UK and US. So that is the uh, the difference between where markets think UK interest rates are going to be in 12 months versus US interest rates. And uh, the black line on the chart is the sterling dollar exchange rate. So conventional wisdom is that higher UK interest rates um, should be beneficial for the pound. So higher rates in the UK compared to US rates should see um, the sterling dollar exchange rate move higher, uh, as it does usually. But this chart shows a sort of breakdown in that correlation, especially since November, um, suggesting that potentially cable should be trading lower in the, in the lower 120s, given that the rate differential uh, has really only oscillated sideways since, um, since November, really, uh, whereas cable has continued to trade, to, to trade higher. So what might better explain the price action that we've seen, uh, the move higher since, since November? Well, expanding out this monetary policy analysis uh, and looking on the, the chart on the right there, looking at the pricing of easing by G3 central banks, i.e. Uh, the Fed, the ECB and Bank of England in total. And we have this better correlation, as you can see, it shows the pound rising against the dollar when more policy easing is priced in and then falling uh, when less policy is, is priced in, so um, less rate cuts being priced in by markets. However, once again, there is still this correlation breakdown uh, towards the end of, uh, towards the beginning of last month. In fact, I, uh, according to the pricing of policy easing, the pound um, arguably should be trading nearer to 124 to 125. Um, but we still have this gap or this disconnect to try and explain. So therefore, 
uh, we look at the broader market environment. So equities and bonds, for example, uh, because it's all interconnected, as, as Boris mentioned at the start. Um, and as you can see here, the, dollar, the, the um, sterling dollar exchange rate has the, this strong positive correlation with global equities. And so it rises when equities rise, rises. Um, and that's because the pound is deemed one of the um, most risk on currencies. So in this kind of environment where we see investors want to take on more risk, in search for more reward, we see uh, equities rising higher, even in cryptocurrencies, we've seen rising higher recently as well. In the FX space, the pound is deemed one of the most attractive, riskier bets amongst the G10 currencies, um, and especially now with its high yield appeal. So this current climate of low volatility and uh, the pro-cyclical um, capital rotation that we've seen since November, has probably supported the pound's appreciation as well. Um, and one might argue that all else being equal, sterling dollars should be trading closer to or even above 130, uh, according to that chart on the left there. But again, as you can see, we've got this divergence, this gap to explain uh, in the equities have left the pound for dust, creating this gap. Um, so where do we look next? The chart on the right, we're looking at this uh, close inverse relationship between volatility in bond markets and sterling against the dollar. Um, so the black line being the move index, which is a gauge of expected volatility in US bond markets. Um, so when volatility falls, i.e. that black line moves higher because that right hand side axis is inverted. Um, when volatility falls, the sterling dollar exchange rate tends to move higher. Uh, and if we zoom in to November, the correlation still holds true, as you can see. And this suggests that the peaking of interest rate hikes and uh, the market expectations of cuts from the major central banks this year has, one, pushed down this volatility in the bond markets and, two, been, supported, uh, been supportive of the pound against the US dollar. And that's despite the fact that we've seen um, a reduction in easing bets and US and UK yields um, rising uh, in a synchronized way, way higher. Um, so where to from here then? Well, if we see a correction lower in equity markets, as this correlation on the left here suggests, we could see um, the risk sensitive pound trend lower. But potentially more importantly, is if we see a spike in cross asset volatility, especially in bonds, that could weigh even heavier on the risk sensitive pound. Um, but another driving factor, of course, uh, behind the currency market trends is the health of economies and growth differentials. And as we know, the US economy has been um, far more robust and strong in the, in the face of monetary tightening than its peers. Uh, the UK, for example, dipping into recession at the end of last year. But this is all sort of lagging data and in the past. And what are we looking for in the future? Um, so the leading indicators like the PMI survey suggest the UK is already out of recession. Uh, we're seeing signs of improvement with um, those PMI showing private sector growth at nine month highs, the services sector really doing the legwork there in the UK as usual. Uh, but this chart on the left here also reflects um, this optimism that we have in the UK. So it's another set of data that's been supportive uh, probably for the pound as well. It's our soft data proxy combining consumer confidence, uh, economic and business expectations. So they're forward looking indicators and this bodes well for Sterling if it continues improving, um, because it appears to have quite this quite a strong positive correlation, even if we span back over multiple years. And you know, this prospect of uh, the, the continued fall in inflation means real wages are, of course, are going to continue rising. It increases the chance of a consumer-led recovery in the UK. Um, so this is potentially a tailwind for the pound, and one that's been supportive over the last few months indeed as well. But one factor or one final factor that I want to draw attention to is positioning. And this is arguably a, uh, a headwind. Um, it's an important one to note. Uh, it's one that we monitor uh, on, on a weekly basis um, because it provides insight into the market sentiment and also whether the market is overstretched uh, or overcrowded in one particular trade direction. So the chart on the right here just showing that speculative traders are net long the pound, i.e. they're holding more bets on the pound appreciating compared to bets on it depreciating in the future. Uh, and in fact, those bets, uh, those net bets on sterling rising are equivalent to $4 billion. And that's double that of the uh, net long USD bets that are currently in place. Um, so it's also close to 15 year highs as well for, for that net long position on the pound and well above the long term average uh, as the chart 
um, displays here, those purple dots being the long-term medium. Um, so the main takeaway here is that, yes, we have this positive sentiment towards the pound, but speculative traders hold this overcrowded bet on the pound appreciating, which paradoxically increases the risk of the pound depreciating, because if these bets are unwound sharply due to an unforeseen event or a big data surprise, for example, uh, then that can lead to a sharp um, weakness or weakening of the, of the British pound. So I appreciate uh, a lot to digest today, uh, but hopefully it gives you a flavour of how intricate and, and interconnected financial markets are, uh, and therefore why accurately forecasting where exchange rates are going to go is an incredibly challenging task. Hence, right, when it comes to uh, decision-making for, for business trading internationally, uh, we advocate that scenario-based approach, as Ruta has already discussed. Uh, and when it comes to sterling dollar, as you can see, the central scenario of the next six months or so is a top of 130 and the bottom of uh, 123. And for us, the short-term outlook is still quite muddied by this decoupling of sterling dollar that we've seen from some of the more prominent coincidence, uh, coincident and leading indicators, as we saw in the previous slides. Uh, but overall, we still lean towards the upside being the path of least resistance over the course of the year. And that's assuming that the Fed does cut rates before the Bank of England and the US economy starts slowing down more, whilst the UK economy starts um, to recover more from the bottom that we witnessed at the end of last year. Uh, from a technical standpoint as well, sterling dollar remains over 20% below its average rate of the 21st century. And that supports Oxford Economics beer model that finds the pound is heavily undervalued against the dollar. So the baseline forecast here, assuming that uh, sterling strength uh, strengthens against the dollar over the forecast horizon, as you can see, um, but it will be a gradual process, more likely, and that's already been evidence from the sleepy start to 2024 that we've had. And then finally, uh, moving on to sterling euro. Uh, as ever, you know, these forecast ranges look even more extreme. So I'd recommend focusing on the grey area, the central scenario, uh, but still in a, indicating a wide range, 124, 109 through to year end. Um, but the baseline forecast of 117 is where we expect those fluctuations um, to to, to move around in a tighter range, maybe one to uh, one to two percent above that and below that kind of one seventeen baseline forecast. Uh, and we think because the Bank of England is probably going to be more hawkish than the uh, ECB, the ECB uh, likely to cut rates before the Bank of England, all else being equal, or absent any other uh, major shocks. I do think the pound has some legs to climb slightly higher against the euro. Wouldn't be surprised to see one eighteen, one nineteen over the next few months. Uh, but as ever, the only thing we can really be certain of is uncertainty, and this could disrupt things uh, and change things drastically. And that's why we produce numerous research pieces on a daily basis. Uh, we have our FX weekly report, we have these monthly reports and webinars, and we have our annual report as well, just to keep abreast of what's going on in this ever-evolving landscape and to help you, our customers, make those more informed decisions when it comes to currency risk management. Um, so thank you for everyone for staying with us so far. Just a, a few final remarks from me before ending uh, today's session. Um, firstly, if you're interested to learn more about uh, our many solutions on offer, then please do reach out to your point of contact at Convera. Uh, you may want more information on how to protect against currency volatility. Uh, perhaps you want more, more information on how to diversify, you help in diversifying into uh, alternative markets, or even talk to us uh, about our efficiency and security. So uh, our automated global payment solutions, uh, our compliance controls or, or fraud prevention measures, for example. And secondly, just to help us um, make sure that we're giving you the best experience uh, and the best insight we can um, do reach out to our team if there's anything that else that you want. If there's any uh, forecast scenarios for different currency pairs, we, we can uh, create them for hundreds of different currency pairs. But even more importantly, you can see on this slide here the QR code at the bottom. Um, and that is for us to get your feedback uh, about today's session. Uh, if you scan that now or with your phones, you can take the survey. It's only a few questions, uh, take less than a minute. Uh, but the survey will be open for the next seven days. Um, so if you don't have a chance now, it will also be available in the follow-up email with the recording of today's session. Uh, and you should receive that in the next 24 hours. Uh, it's here on the next page as well, if you missed it. Uh, but a final note from me is a thank you to uh, all of our speakers today, Boris and Ruta, top job as usual, 
And a very big thank you to our audience um, for joining us today. Wishing you all the best and see you next time. Cheers.